Uh, welcome, everybody, to the second Powering Business with Blockchain, uh, presented by Ava Labs. Today, we're really excited to welcome our partners from Deloitte um, to talk about how Deloitte is using Avalanche to power business. Um, if you tuned into our first Powering Business with Blockchain, we discussed uh, payments and all things uh, USDC related with the CEO of Circle, Jeremy Allaire. Um, and as may, many of you may know, Ava Labs uh, is a strategic alliance partner with, with Deloitte. Uh, I'm John Nahas. I'm Vice President of Business Development here at Ava Labs, uh, supporting Avalanche, and I'll be moderating today and leading this discussion. Uh, we'll do some quick intros. Uh, from the Ava Labs side, we're joined by Nick Muslim. Nick, why don't you just do a quick intro of yourself? Sure. Nick Muslim, uh, Senior Vice President and Head of Product at Ava Labs, um, responsible for everything product related inside Avalabs and also been working very closely with the Deloitte team on both the Alliance and Close As You Go, which we'll talk about today. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Alexis, why don't you uh, welcome and why don't you give everyone a quick intro on yourself? Thanks. Hey, everyone. My name is Alexis White. Um, I work at Deloitte um, and I focus full of time on business development for Close As You Go and um, making sure that we accelerate our sales efforts and starting in the Southeast, but really nationwide um, to scale. Thanks, Alexis. Peter? Thanks, John. Uh, hello, world. I see there's a lot of people from everywhere. My name is uh, Peter Mueller. I am the solution architect for Close As You Go. I've been with Deloitte for about three and a half, four years now. I have a heavy background in cybersecurity and um, protocol analysis. I uh, did a lot of work for the US government. Um, I've been in the blockchain space since about, say, 2012, when I built my first Bitcoin ASIC miner on 28 nanometer architecture. I know that's like ancient technology now, but that's what we did back then. 200 amp service in my house, almost blew up the place. But here I am now building software with blockchain and looking forward to talking about it. Thanks, Peter. Um, so both of you have mentioned Close As You Go. That's the first product that Deloitte has developed uh, with Avalanche. So why don't you guys give everybody on this uh, webinar a little bit of background as to what Close As You Go is and how it's being uh, used and what the intent is. Sure. Well, I'll start by setting the stage on our first use case, which is FEMA public assistance. And I know we've got an international crowd, so um, I'll explain a little bit about what public assistance is and how we use Close As You Go in that space. Um, but essentially, public assistance is a federal reimbursement program that's administered by FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, and it provides federal funding to help communities respond to and recover from disasters. Um, so what FEMA does is they will reimburse state and local governments and certain eligible private not-for-profits organizations for the cost of anything related to recovering from a disaster. So that could be um, picking up debris from a street or doing emergency protective measures before a disaster hits, um, permanent repair work to infrastructure such as damaged roads or bridges. Um, so all of those things, the local governments and state governments are responsible for paying for, um, but FEMA will reimburse them up to 75% and sometimes more for the cost of those recovery efforts. Um, so what applicants do is they'll submit requests for public assistance to the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA um, within 30 days of the disaster declaration. Um, so what the applicants are responsible for doing and, and why we're helping in this space is they're responsible for demonstrating that they are eligible applicants, that whatever facility they are repairing or fixing is an eligible facility, that they have jurisdiction or legal responsibility to perform the work. To, re to repair after the disaster, um, and then also proving that any costs that they expended um, are reasonable and substantiating those costs. So there's a lot that goes into that review process. It's multi-layered. Um, there are a lot of actors involved. You've got the local government, the state government, and then FEMA at the federal level. And so all of those different organizations are working together to administer this very complex program. There are a lot of regulations. There's a lot of documentation um, and also some distress that you see in grantor-grantee relationships where there are large amounts of dollars being administered. So that's where Closes You Go comes in, um, kind of acting as the agnostic place where you can see there's an immutable record of all the actions that you've taken in your recovery efforts to make sure that you've done that in a compliant manner. Um, so that's just a high level over of our FEMA use case. Um, and, and Peter will get a little bit more into the technical side of, of Closes You Go and how the blockchain helps with that. Thanks, Alexis. Yeah, so Closes You Go, let's, let's, let's talk about what that is. This is a private instantiation of Ava Labs awesome technology living in GCP. 
so we've taken the blockchain and we've privatized it in our instance of GCP that Deloitte controls. Around the blockchain are a whole bunch of services that we use for scaling services such as file store, file base, SQL, all the good stuff that you can find in, in, in your, your typical cloud environments. Now that's important. And I wanna keep this theme going throughout our talk here is that blockchain is not the solution. I know everyone's like very focused on that, but blockchain is part of the solution. The solution answers the challenge, uh, something that is inefficient, something that is expensive, something that doesn't work right. That's what the solution does. Blockchain centric solutions put blockchain abstracted away from the actual use case, the actual solution that you're using, because let's all face it, blockchain is a back end technology and it should be. Um, in this case, blockchain does a number of things. Uh, it does all your classic uh, logistics pieces. It does uh, auditing. It does tracking. You can see what's happened, all that good stuff. But some of the cooler things it does that we've leveraged here are what I've, what I've coined as cryptographic permissioning. What do I mean by that? Uh, my team, we have this philosophy that you can use blockchain in a cybersecurity uh, method. Uh, it increases your cyber posture by creating an extra layer of security around critical functions within the tech stack. I'm not putting down Active Directory and that, that all still works, but something like uh, using a smart contract for determining critical functionality and what you can do as a user and can't do as a user is a super powerful tool because now we can create smart functions or smart contracts that one, determine what you can do, tell us when you do them, and three, keep a record of when they were done. That's really powerful when you're talking about, let's say, for example, updating uh, firmware. On a, on a device, imagine creating a bridge or a gate where you have to create a blockchain transaction to sign that as a uh, authenticated administrator. Same thing here works in close you go. Our administrators have keys that can change the environments for our clients and our clients have keys that they use to sign on. Now I know everyone's thinking how they sign on. Well, we use a service called Magic Link. Magic Link uh, is basically an email link that clicks, that gets sent to you and you click on it and you sign in that way. Is it 100% secure? No, nothing is 100% secure, but it is an extremely powerful way to make it as secure as possible. And so this is all powered by smart contracts and that's a really cool thing we're using blockchain for in the system. In the end, Close You Go is a platform for workflows that can be customized to a use case. In this case, the use case is FEMA. I think we'll go on from there, John. Great, yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, thanks, Alexis. That's fantastic. I believe you guys have a demo. So before we get more deep into this, why don't we show people what you guys have actually built and, and give people kind of an idea of what it's like to build a real world solution that's being used by you know real economies and governments that's been with it with, with the architecture, the blockchain architecture in the background. Sure. Um, so what you'll see or what a user would see when they first log in, and again, they use that magic link. Um, so it's a passwordless entry. They just have to log in um, without a password, which the feedback that we've gotten from um, clients and, and pilot users is that, you know, it's really awesome not having to, to remember a password or type in a password every time you log into the application. Um, but essentially, in the pre-event activity section of our platform, we've divided it into four categories. And these are the four categories of information that FEMA is going to um, request information for when an applicant or a sub-applicant is submitting their request for reimbursement. Um, so the first section is your vendor management, and that's going to be a list of all of the vendors that that applicant was working with in their recovery, um, making sure that they've done their procurement and their contracting um, up to federal regulations and making sure that they're staying um, within those requirements. Um, we then have our facilities, equipment, and materials section. So again, you have to prove that it is an eligible facility and that you have the legal responsibility over that facility. Um, and there's a host of other information that FEMA will require. So pre-disaster photographs to verify that you were keeping up with the facility and, and prove the, the facility um, condition, excuse me, before the disaster, um, maintenance records, all that information that FEMA is going to require can be uploaded here. Um, similar with equipment and materials, any equipment that um, a jurisdiction might be using in their recovery efforts, such as a cop car um, or a truck that they're using, um, they can actually link that piece of equipment to um, its equipment rate with FEMA. Um, lastly, any materials that they're using, so things like batteries, um, sandbagging, uh, nails, hammers, any type of material that 
um, they're using in the recovery, they can upload and have a record of all that information here, um, along with invoices and receipts. Um, next are the policies, procedures, plans, and permits. So um, Peter mentioned earlier that the pro platform can be somewhat customizable to um, the use case. And then also if um, a locality has their own policies, their procedures, um, any plans that they have in place that are specific to them, this kind of acts like a document library. So they can upload those policies to prove to FEMA, you know, this is what my pay policy was before the disaster and it's in compliance with how I paid my employees um, when they were responding it to the recovery efforts. Alexis, can I just jump in there one moment? Yeah, uh, sure. I just want everyone to realize that, yeah, I know some of you are thinking, where's the blockchain? Well, that's the point. You don't see the blockchain. The blockchain shouldn't be seen, but it is working in the background. Whenever something is changed in the system, that is reflected in the blockchain. And mm -hmm. as I go back to my discussion about cryptographic permissioning, whenever you want to change something, that has to be confirmed through a blockchain transaction to let that happen. So there's a lot of blockchain happening in the background here. You just don't see it. Right. And I'll show an example, actually. If we go into vendor management, um, I'll click into my vendor um, and this is where they could upload the contract that they have with that particular vendor. So if I were to click into um, and view that contract, I'm an, in it as an administrator. Um, I can see the blockchain transaction, but an end user would not see that transaction happening. So if I click to view this contract, you'll see up here, it's recording my action in the blockchain. And I'll get a little pop-up saying that transaction was confirmed. Um, but our end users don't see that. So the blockchain is working in the background constantly. Any action that you complete in the, pro in the platform um, is being recorded in that ledger. Awesome. This is super exciting. Um, so I guess pivoting a little bit, um, Peter, I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. Um, why is there a need for blockchain in this specific uh, use case and in future use cases similar to this? And then... Building on that, on top of why is a blockchain needed, why Avalanche? That, that's, that's awesome. It's because why, why blockchain? Everyone always says, well, why do you need blockchain? Well, I think, I think we've gotten kind of bogged down in that question, why blockchain? And then we follow these stringent rules about, well, trust and doesn't need to be distributed and all this. I'd like, I'd like to leave the message that forget all those rules. Blockchain is a tool that we developers and architects use to build software. It's no different than including other protocols, your SMTPs. You don't care about SMTP, you care about your emails working. This is the same situation here. We, we picked blockchain because we wanted the security piece, the cryptographic permissioning uh, that took some development, but it fits nicely in there because of the natural cryptographic features of blockchain. We wanted the tracking, the auditing portion. We all know blockchain does that well. You can do anything from tracking lettuce to tracking functions executing in a, in a, in a stack. Uh, that's important. And blockchain answers the mail there. And the blockchain fits nicely in there. Uh, it, it's not contrived, it's not forced. Uh, it, it does it well. And now there, like I said, there are other technologies that do that, but blockchain complements those very well. So that's why we pick them. And specifically, Avalanche, why do we pick that? Well, from our perspective, the Ava team, Ava team has a, a really good, uh, understanding of enterprise software and how blockchain fits in enterprise software. Now, what am I getting at there? I want the blockchain world out there to understand that we can't force feed blockchain down the throats of people who are interested in blockchain. You can't just say public Ethereum, go. That's not how it works, it, not at all. You've got to do this step by step. And we needed a partner who understands that, you know, okay, first step, here's a private instantiation of Avalanche inside GCP. That doesn't mean we don't support a public instantiation of it, not at all. But for example, the US government is not ready for that. They're not ready to say, here it is. If you don't like it too bad, deal with it. No, no, no. We have to do this in steps. And that's the pragmatic approach to blockchain. You, you can't fix the world. You can't fix everything all at once. We've got to gradually get into it. And eventually it will be so integrated that we won't even be talking about it. We won't have these, these webinars. It'll just be another protocol we include in, in, uh, in our technology. And I think that's, that's the most important part about the Avalanche team. They understand that this is big, absolutely. But for people to consume it, we got to break it down to little pieces. And we do that inside our technology. That's, that's awesome, Peter. Thanks for, for, for going there. Um, Nick, I want to turn this over to you. I know that you know on the product side and me on the business side, we, we see a ton of enterprises and companies that come to us and say, we want a blockchain solution. And then when we usually say why, 
it's because they want a blockchain solution. Not that it's needed, but they just want that. So we spend a lot of time uh, usually pushing back unless there's there's true value. Of course, the Deloitte team is building amazing things and we're excited about this partnership. But I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit to you, Nick, and kind of, you know, if, to, to talk to, to our participants here and let them know kind of where you're seeing, right, a lot of this enterprise um, kind of interest coming from, what cases matter and what kind of don't. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, when I first learned about the Deloitte use case and what they were doing, we were super excited. It's very unique in the fact that, you know, this is not a cryptocurrency play, right? You have to abstract the cryptocurrency completely out of this. This is blockchain without crypto. Governments aren't going to hold crypto on their balance sheets. And so what we're doing here is we're really looking at, at a problem set, right? How do we create transparency? Like mean, government agencies are necessarily complex in what they do. And there's a lot of different channels that need to be involved to get a single process through, right? To get a, a FEMA application approved, to get the recovery funds down to the people that need them. Right? You have to go through various agencies at various levels, and they all need to have some sequential dependencies on proof of what has happened in the past. And so that is an ideal use case for blockchains because you have both the auditability, as Peter talked about, and you have the accountability in, in the transaction history. You also have um, tamper resistance, right? And so by creating this very clear workflow management, which it really is, and taking all these agencies, they can really understand where everybody is in the process. The applicant can understand where they are in the process. So that becomes a lot more clear. And then you can make sure that the process was followed as it was supposed to be followed, which reduces all, you know, any clawbacks that could happen, which is just unnecessary waste of, of time and not the appropriate use for these funds. So, you know, this was a very exciting use case for us and we were um, super happy to support their team in, in delivering this. We loop back. And so they've done this, this implementation on um, the private instantiation and we've looked towards um, where do we go from here? So where we think there's a lot of value is moving um, from private and, and the private will always have a case to uh, what we're calling a public private where you're taking um, these types of applications and then you're essentially publishing a hash to a public chain. And what that public hash does is it gives you a proof at a point of time. It's basically an attestation as to what the state of the chain is at any given time, which allows for several different functions, but the main one would be um, tamper resistance. So if it was ever changed in the past, you could essentially go back and figure out what the state should have been and what, what has changed in that process. Um, I'd add to that, Nick, that, you know, it's uh, what that, that attestation can do is provide proof of something that can be private. So if there is information in your system, not just the blockchain, but all the systems around it, if there is a state, a hash of that state, you're basically letting people know that everything is as it should be from that point without actually revealing what's in the system. That, that's powerful. Absolutely. So... And, and Sorry, go ahead, John. Hey, I mean, look, we're going into a lot of these, the technical details, which are exciting and amazing. But I'd like to pivot to Alexis real quick, as someone on the BD side. Alexis, when you're out there talking to municipalities and localities and partners that might be adopting Close As You Go, of course, the high level understanding of Close As You Go serves as the purpose. But do you build into that pitch and to that explanation, the blockchain element and the avalanche element? And if so, at what level? And what, what are you seeing kind of from the people that are using it what are their questions as to the role of blockchain here? Are, like, I guess the, to repurpose this question, how much emphasis are you doing on the blockchain side? And then how, what, what, is, what are the responses that you're getting and in, in the interest from parties? All right, well, we see kind of a wide variety of responses. Um, for the most part, a lot of our clients or a lot of the people that we are talking to have a very they don't have a high level of familiarity of blockchain. And if they do, they think Bitcoin. So they aren't familiar with how it would interface with our platform. And so what we do is we kind of um, approach it from a security aspect. So we have a lot of clients that say, oh, I don't want to upload all of my information online because some incident happened with some other vendor and, and all of this stuff happened. And we're, we're touting it as there's security in that blockchain. You have the immutable record of all of the actions that you're taking. Um, and eventually also whoever's reviewing what you're 
you're uploading, whether it be the state or whether it be FEMA, um, they also have, like Peter mentioned, that auditable trail of all the information that you're uploading. And that helps to expedite their recovery. It helps them in their security of all the documentation they're submitting. Um, so to answer your question, we keep it relatively high level, but um, really what resonates with a lot of the folks that we're talking to is just the security in the blockchain um, and how that could potentially help them um, get their funding faster and also reduce the clawbacks. So I think for those at home or, or at work watching today, um, a, a key takeaway is that despite all of us being kind of very deep into this technology and, and, and working in it and, and, and kind of it encapsulates everything that we do, for the common person or for the end user, it's kind of abstracted away, right? So ultimately, for as much as we think we're far along in this journey, we are still at the very beginning of where this technology can really start to impact people's lives in real world use cases outside of the traditional crypto stuff that people are kind of used to on a daily basis. Uh, I'd argue we're still in the hype cycle, John. I mean, we, people still ask about blockchain. Like I said before, once we stop talking about it and it's just part of solutions, then we'll be there. Um, as a solution architect, whenever I talk to the clients and we're talking about what's a possible, you know, solution look like, I don't even try to mention the word blockchain. I mean, when I go to DevCon, I tell people there, you know, outside these walls, you know what people don't care about? They don't care about blockchain. They care about answers to their problems. That's what we need to do. Absolutely. The more answers we can, we can give, the better off we'll be. Yeah, I, I've said this on, on panels before, right? When they ask the, the typical question of, of when do you know blockchain has arrived? And I and my typical answer is always when you don't know it's being used, right? That's right. It's like nobody cares what's behind Venmo and Zelle and PayPal and what other, other technology they're using as long as it's faster and cheaper and better in, in, in any aspect than we've arrived. So that's awesome. Um, Peter, you know, I'd like to kind of hammer down now on the Avalanche use case, right? And and kind of what about Avalanche in particular makes it ideally suited, in your opinion, for enterprises more broadly, not just close as you go? Well, uh, I guess there's a couple of ways to look at it. From the technical point of view, people are one, they always want to ask about transactions per second, right? We all get caught up in that, that number. In terms of finality, um, Avalanche is amazing. I mean, what are we down to less than a second? Whatever, a second. I, I call it instant. That's pretty much instant to me. Um, that's, a, that's a big talking point for people to get caught up in that. I'd say from there though, it's not so much about TPS transactions per second as it is transaction design. That's more important. Uh, and Avalanche uh, in terms of design and those transactions, Avalanche just follows, follows the standards. Uh, if we have those yet, I'm not sure, but so your Solidity developers out there can jump right into the pool with, with Avalanche and start building out smart contracts. Um, I think from my, from my point of view, that is going to be the eventual standard, how things are done. Um, so that, that makes it, uh, that gives it a big support group for developers. And I'd say the Avalanche developers have been super supportive in, in our strange usage of their technology. Um, and that's a big piece, why, why Ava Labs. They're not, they're not in their little hole somewhere that they're not accessible. They're very accessible. And I think they're open to new ideas about blockchain. That's important for other firms out there. You're looking to use blockchain for whatever use case. Um, that's super important that that, that conversation continues. Uh, and that I, and in my opinion, that conversation is as public as it can be. I think, I think I'm pretty sure Ava uh, understands that. And um, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, from a personal point of view, we've known the Ava team for a while, and I can I can definitely vouch for them from my 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 point of view that they're they're awesome, and and that's that's an important piece. Thanks, Peter. Um, well, we know why Deloitte chose that Avalanche. Nick, uh, turning it back over to you, can you kind of you know building on what Peter said as to why why Deloitte? What are you seeing on your side, right, that makes Avalanche ideally suited for enterprise use more broadly in, in a number of different applications? For sure. And, and I just want to build on Peter's point too, that you know the Deloitte team has really opened our minds to, hey, there are these use cases that are specific to government um, that maybe we hadn't thought about, right? And we kind of get into that public private one. And then I think as we get into enterprise, what we're seeing is, you know, it's not, um, there's going to be a single blockchain to rule them all, or even there's going to be one shoe that fits, one shoe size that fits everybody, right? Uh, blockchains need to be customized and they need to be specific to the use case of of what the builder needs. And so in the case of government, right, we need subnets, 
right? So their own blockchains is essentially what, what Deloitte has done here, right? They have a very talented team that's just build an instant, instantiation of it. But Avalanche is making that much simpler now with subnet so that you can just create your own blockchain. And then at a level below that, start to customize it, not at the smart contract layer, but at the VM layer. And so what that's going to allow is for governments to meet the security needs they need. They're going to be able to control who their validators are. Um, and they're going to be able to create you know, pre-compiles or anything that they don't want the smart contract layer to make everything more secure. And so the goal then is, is with partnerships with, with like AWS um, and GCP is basically to create these push button deployments that government agencies that have then said, we, we approve of this structure, of this subnet, of this blockchain uh, entity. And so it's much faster for them to get to market and therefore ultimately, you know, like Alexis and Peter talked about, bring the solutions back to solve problems and, and kind of abstract away the blockchain technology. And on that point, Nick, a faster, one thing I, I forgot to mention, uh, going back to the finality piece, because this has a user interface, uh, in this case, we use a React front end uh, in order for it to react, sorry, terrible pun, but in order for it to react quickly, the blockchain's got to be quick. It's got to reach finality. It's got to be in a state that can, it can react to. That's an important piece for us because if our clients feel like um, this is going too slow, why? Oh, we are waiting on the blockchain to close. That's a, that's a that's a deal breaker. Um, that's a major piece of Avalanche that that fits in here into the use case and the user experience. Remember, UX is awfully awfully uh, not talked about enough in the blockchain world, and UX is an important part. Or no one's going to want to use blockchain technologies. So Nick, you 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 you, you said the, the the magic word of the month for us over here. Uh, at Ava Labs and, and in the broader Avalanche ecosystem, and that's subnet. So can you, for those of us joining today, kind of give a quick kind of update primer on what subnets are like and how where we see the use cases in this particular instance, more with enterprise, of course, in government, which you touched upon, but can you give a high level on what subnets are and why we're so excited about them? Sure. So subnets are essentially custom blockchains and they're built, they're extremely flexible and they're built to suit what the use case needs are for them. So, you know, we're seeing heavy subnet usage for in really two areas. One is gaming and GameFi, right? And so gamers have very specific needs. They need really fast throughput. They need you know, um, low time to finality and they need to keep their transaction costs low. And they do this by creating specific blockchains that serve their needs. The same for government, right? They have a totally different regulatory um, confines to work around. And so what the subnets allow them to do is to create their own blockchain, customize that blockchain specific to their needs through the use of custom VMs, pre-compiles, um, and then really be able to manage who validates and who participates in that specific blockchain. So subnets as a whole, custom blockchains for very specific sector-based use cases. Peter, building on that, how do you see kind of subnets for your use cases and for future use cases for Deloitte and your and your clients? Yeah, indeed, subnet has a play here. Uh, we are in the planning phases of the subnet uh, idea. Uh, going back to the attestation hash, we have a couple other ideas uh, around it. Uh, because this is a, a government play right now, uh, there are, let's call them subtleties that have to be addressed. Um, you know, questions that are asked, there are people who are not as tech savvy on blockchain as some of us. So the second you mention an idea like, well, why don't we put a public hash out there? They might not know what hash is. They might not know that it doesn't mean we're putting out private information. There's questions that need to be answered and people need to understand, be comfortable with it. Um, that's part of the challenge with blockchain technology. We build it, but many people are not comfortable with it, even though many of us understand that the walls we tear down actually create better security features. Um, but that, that's the change in the paradigm. And when people say uh, blockchain is a disruptive technology, subnets will be the same thing. They'll be disruptive within the blockchain world. Because uh, again, going back to these stringent rules we've been following the last couple of years, those rules really don't apply. Uh, it's all about the solution. And I think subnets are gonna fit very well into many people's need for that bridge between private and public uh, or protection of whatever is private from the public yet still giving the attestation to the public. Awesome. Uh, we're starting to get a bunch of questions coming in from those listening, but before I jump into those, 
Alexis, I want to kind of turn this back over to you now, kind of public facing, right? Where, so you're, you're, you're out there discussing clothes as you go, but what are you seeing kind of also, and what are you hearing from your clients and from Deloitte's clients as to kind of solutions or things that they want, right? Like where do they want to see blockchain, whether that makes sense or not, as we all know, there's always, there's not a necessary solution with blockchain always, but where are you seeing the demand? Where are you seeing the interest mostly from your clients? Um, a lot of the interest is coming from, so I'll go start by explaining how the FEMA application process works. So you have three levels, essentially FEMA at the top as the grantor, and then you have the state level in the middle as the applicant. And then any entity within that state that's eligible, a local government, a county, city, um, some eligible private or nonprofits, um, they're submitting that application through the state who then submits that to FEMA. And so I think really where the interest lies is figuring out how to create, again, trust between those three as they're submitting their, their information. FEMA's verifying that. Um, it's reducing the amount of time that FEMA has to come back and say, hey, you didn't do this right, or hey, um, your contract is missing this piece of information. And so where the interest really lies is just how we can work together with um, a reviewer, so whether that's the federal government, whether that's the state government, and then the local sub applicant, how those they can interface a little better, reduce those questions between the do between the two, reduce the time spent kind of figuring out where the documentation lies, um, and just having it all compiled in one central location um, is the biggest draw. And I think also a lot of times, a lot of these governments that um, our teams work with or that we go and talk to, they're doing this on paper and an Excel file. Um, and especially for the information that's stored in a facility on paper, if you have a disaster, um, so you have a tornado or a hurricane that levels a building that has all of your files and all of your information in it, um, then what do you do? How do you submit your documentation? You don't have it, so you can't submit that information. Um, so really, I think the biggest draw is just having it all in one central location that whether you're a reviewer or you're submitting your application, um, everyone can kind of log in and see where that information was submitted, when it was submitted. Um, and so there aren't any questions about, you know, when something was done or how it was done. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, to those of you tuning in, tuning in or that are in, there's a question and answer uh, Q&A button on the bottom. So feel free to ask any questions. Um, there's a ton over here that I'm filtering through. Some are relevant, some of course are not. Um, so I'm going to try and focus on some of those. So I do want to spend the next 10 or 12 minutes going over some of the questions that, that those in the audience have, have asked us. Um, the one that caught my attention that, that I'd like to kind of turn over maybe to Nick and, and then Peter over to you as well. Um, or, or somebody's asked, is it, do you guys envision or see it feasible to create kind of a no code um, software like a WordPress or a Wix or a Shopify version of blockchains? for small businesses or medium-sized businesses to kind of deploy their own use cases on blockchain? And if so, how far away are we from that reality? So uh, this is something we're working on now, right? We, did, we definitely think it's feasible and it start, you know, we really are working to abstract the blockchain layers away. It's, it's not, the people that want to build are building towards a specific use case, the meta around consensus algorithms, the networking layer, launching, supporting blockchains is something that, um, we really want to take out as much as possible. And so that's where the, the partnerships with AWS and, and working towards managed services goes. As you work your way up that stack, say into the Solidity layer, we know of several um, partners that are working on just that, which is kind of no code, either drag and drop logic or other, other means of putting in certain key repeatable functionality. I do think there's always going to be a level of customization based on the use case. So I think the, the world of, you know, just push something out that's just doesn't require any technical um, skill set is probably a ways out. But I think there's a path in between there that's, that we'll probably see in the very near future. Great. Peter, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would. Uh, I'm on the same page with Nick. Uh, right now, though, I, I think we're further away than we are closer. Right now, uh, the rub with blockchain is it is inherently technical. I know people don't like to hear this and I've got an argument on LinkedIn with people, but I'm here to tell you to design properly with blockchain, you need to understand it from a technical level. If you do not, the solution that you can think of might be disastrous. There's, there's subtleties and nuances that right now are not addressed by low code, no code um, platforms. I'm not saying they don't exist and they can't be done. Absolutely. But it will still require 
an understanding of decentralized design, distributed architecture design, and all the things and buzzwords we use inside the blockchain uh, development world. It's, it's going to be tough, but I think there is a future in it once we figure that part out. I'm smiling and smirking when you said you argue with people and fight with people on LinkedIn about this because I argue with Nick about this all the time where I come up with ideas with partners and Nick Nick tells me it, it sounds easy because it's hard. Um, so uh, the things that to the average person sound easier, sound like a simple solution. It's simple and easy, right? Because technology allows it to be so. And that technology usually is very difficult and complex in the background to allow things otherwise that would be difficult to be easy. Um, shifting over, um, and Alexis, if you can give a stab at this, there's like several questions that I have. I'm going to try and condense them into one that have to do with UX and UI. Um, so how difficult, I guess, do you see the UX and UI experience with blockchain being and kind of what you guys have done with Close As You Go is abstracted it away, right? So mm -hmm. does blockchain need to be visible? I know you showed a, a demo in which it's there, but at what, I mean, I guess what challenges are specific to blockchain with UX and UI, if you can start? So like I mentioned in the demo, it's not visible to our end users. It's really just visible to us. Um, and so there isn't a challenge that we've run into so far. Um, I kind of think of it like car insurance. You know it's there, you have it if you need it, but you don't really think about your car insurance on a day-to-day. -day. And that's kind of how it is for our clients. You know, they know it is a blockchain enabled platform. They may not know necessarily what that means for them um, unless they need it, right? Unless they needed to audit a record of what they're doing. And so um, I think it's important in that having it there, but uh, as far as having it in the user interface, um, our clients, they don't need to know that it's there. They don't need to see the transactions. Um, and, and on our end, every time there is a transaction, we have to click and accept that transaction. And so it makes it a little easier for the end users when they can just make, do an action and they don't have to worry about having extra clicks. So I don't really see it being as a challenge the way um, our awesome develop, development team has developed the platform. Um, it's not something that is a blocker or, or a hindrance to our users using the platform. Peter, what are you seeing as kind of the challenges on the UX UI side? Um, I think the challenge in a, as a general statement is people want to showcase the blockchain but I got to keep encouraging them, don't showcase it. And, and that, that reflects in the UX UI. Um, just recently I had a discussion with someone about Web3 and it's a little out of the context here, but I think that Web3 is the UX expression, the UI expression of blockchain. Uh, I'm still wrestling with the idea that Web3 might be a sub category of blockchain or if it's a technology on its own that supports blockchain. Because Web3 and blockchain, they're they are different things. They're not the same thing. Um, but I think uh, as we go forward, technologies like Web3 will help us um, abstract the blockchain further away, but still have it power the back end. So I'll jump in here and give, 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 give a personal opinion as well. You know, I, I often, uh, you know, asked, you know, that, that question, like I mentioned earlier, right? When has it arrived? And I, and I say, like we all do here, on this on this call that when you not, don't know it's being used, but I I might have somewhat of a of, of an opinion that I've gotten some flack for, in that I think Web three people or blockchain kind of uh, based people are somewhat elitist in the sense, and what I mean by that is uh, we we try to talk about this open financial system and building better tools and more more transparent tools and breaking down barriers, yet the barrier to entry is so high, the educational floor is so high. You need to buy crypto. You need to send it to a wallet. You need to connect your wallet. There's a seed phrase. There's all these complexities that for people that are trying to be inclusive uh, in this technology, we have set a very high floor. My mother is never going to use a MetaMask. You know, um, my kids aren't going to know how to, aren't going to, aren't going to be buying crypto on an exchange. So ultimately the floor needs to be lowered, right? UX, UI needs to be just like we saw with close as you go. You don't even know, need to know that it's being there. And at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is faster, cheaper, better product, right? And as a base layer foundation, Avalanche allows uh, for that. Question uh, fr from someone in the group um, that I think is good for those tuning in, especially on the enterprise side. Um, Peter, maybe could you explain the main difference between creating a solution using a blockchain versus 
what people would normally use in like an AWS or Google Cloud or some other database, right? Why, why go this route? I just, you know, for most people, why use this when, and then I guess people normally think blockchains are more expensive and slower. So, uh, right. Um, well, yeah, why? I think that's up to your solution architect. Uh, and, and if they understand distributed architecture, uh, they'll find a place for that blockchain if it's appropriate. I emphasize if it's appropriate, not forced in there. You don't build a hammer and then look for a nail. Um, as I said, like for example, our, our logon and our, our, our um, credentials in the system, we could use Active Directory, absolutely. But we chose to use smart contracts instead. Why? Um, because we felt that some of the potential attack vectors within Active Directory, for example, privilege escalation attacks, um, we could eliminate, well, eliminate, eliminate's a bad word, uh, we could minimize the, the uh, option and, and, and minimize the attack surface for these classical threats, uh, both insider and outsider threats. Um, it, it's really, it's, and it goes back to design again. It's all about what your client or the problem set is and if it's appropriate at that moment. Yes, there are absolutely many services and technologies that work that are similar to blockchain, but if you find that the cryptographic uh, powers of blockchain and the distributed powers of blockchain are appropriate to a solution. And they give you some kind of advantage or uh, it betters your situation, then absolutely that's the time to use them. And don't get hung up in all the rules and sit there and, you know, trust and all this stuff. No, no, don't, don't get too lofty. Think of it from a purely technical point of view. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more quick question. So somebody asked, um, other networks have, have taken steps to address self-sovereign identity problems. Um, does Avalanche have plans for an SSI style tool in the future, Nick? Definitely. So, I mean, we have this whole world that we call decentralized ID. Um, this is also a core tenant of the roadmap of, of um, our, our core release that's coming out in the upcoming weeks. Um, so yeah, we want, I mean, the, the, there's so many promises of, of Web3 specifically one of them is the ability to own your own data. So instead of going from site to site and giving them the necessary data, you basically own your data and then you either have a single source which you trust to, to provide that data out, right? Or to, to say like, yes, I can um, authenticate that this is true or you just get it like a zero knowledge proof, which I think is like the golden goose where somebody asks for something like, hey, does your SSN end in 1234? And you basically say, yes, I can prove, um, you know, there's a, there's a proof that I can say that, that allows you to say, yes, that's what it is. And then the transaction happens. So um, definitely something we're, we're heavily focused on. Uh, it's on the roadmap for this year. And, uh, you know, these are new problems that we're solving, I think, in this case. And so we need to make sure that the, that the solution we're putting forward does actually solve the problem and not just and not create new problems. And I think that that's what we're very carefully considering while we while we roll this out. Awesome, Nick. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for, for, for highlighting a lot of the things that are coming out of the product team at Ava Labs. Um, Alexis, Peter, thank you guys for joining us today. We're really excited to see Close As You Go continue to grow, Alexis. Um, so thank you for that effort. And Peter, thank you for, for of course, building on Avalanche. Um, would love to continue. We're going to continue building more things. And I think as everybody has seen with the excitement around subnets, tons of, uh, of new use cases are going to be are going to be taken advantage of here. I'd like to thank you all uh, who are joining us today for your time and for your questions uh, in the second part of the Powering Business with Blockchain series. This record, this uh, webinar will be recorded and will be available for those of you that were not able to watch today or to share with colleagues. Um, so thank you for your time and we'll catch you at the next one. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it.